the largest anti-government protest yet in Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is refusing to accept the Gaza ceasefire deal that's on the table, which includes the release of captives. What could force his hand or even force him out of office? This is Inside Story. Hello again, I'm James Bayes. Calls for a Gaza ceasefire are growing louder in Israel. As many as three quarters of a million people came out in major cities on Saturday demanding that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu agree to a deal to bring home the remaining captives. But he remains defiant, insisting the war will continue until Hamas is eliminated. So what will it take for Netanyahu to sign an agreement? Could pressure from Israel's allies, including the US, make a difference? We'll explore all these issues with our panel of guests who join us in just a moment. But first, this report from Katya lopez Hodayan. Pressure is mounting on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, with hundreds of thousands of protesters demanding he agree on a deal to free the remaining captives held in Gaza. We have to shout loud that we have to bring them alive now. We cannot wait any longer. Eleven months into the war, numerous attempts to reach a ceasefire deal have failed. Protesters accuse Netanyahu of intentionally prolonging the military offensive in Gaza to appease his right-wing coalition, which has the power to vote him out. The Israeli government and everybody in the world who can do something to bring back our hostages, do it now. But the prime minister insists Hamas is responsible for obstructing an agreement and for the killing of six captives, whose bodies were recovered from a tunnel in Rafah a week ago. Doubts linger over whether these latest demonstrations, the biggest yet, will make a difference. Because we're not in elections right now, and it would require a collapse of the existing coalition in order to bring us into elections, this the 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 hostage deal, a ceasefire deal, does depend on the current leadership. And it is hard to imagine them taking their cues from these protests. Despite international pressure, the latest round of ceasefire talks are believed to have stalled because of a dispute over the control of the Palestinian side of the border crossing between Gaza and Egypt, known as the Philadelphia Corridor. The Philadelphia Corridor cannot be perforated. Somebody has to be there. And it's obvious why. You want to destroy Hamas's uh, military and governing capabilities, you can't let Hamas rearm. It's obvious. So you have to control the corridor. This was not a point of contention in previous round of discussions, and some Israeli politicians say it's time to change strategy. Let's be honest, the Philadelphia Corridor is an operational challenge, but it is not an existential threat to the state of Israel. This is the Middle East. Some analysts suggest Netanyahu may be stalling negotiations to remain in office and avoid a court battle. The prime minister's corruption charges date back well before the war. If he's not in office, those legal troubles could resurface. Despite pressures both at home and abroad to end the war on Gaza, Netanyahu remains defiant, raising the question, what will it take for him to sign a deal? Katia lopez Odoyan, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our guests today. Joining us from Tel Aviv, we have Dan Perry, author of Israel and the Quest for Permanence. He's a former regional bureau chief for the Associated Press. In West Jerusalem, Ilan Baruch is chairman of the Policy Working Group, which advocates for policies based on a two-state solution. He's a former Israeli ambassador to South Africa. And in London, Professor Yossi Meckelberg is an associate fellow at the Chatham House think tank who specialises in Israeli and Middle East politics. Thank you, all three of you. Welcome to Inside Story Israel. Um, I'm always very wary of crowd sizes because there are always big estimates involved uh, and different people tell you different things. But some reports saying half a million, some, some saying 750,000 people protesting in Tel Aviv as well as other towns and cities. Ilan, that would make this the biggest demonstration in Israel's history. How significant? I think it galvanizes 
um, a silent majority that uh, failed in uh, in the elections now for quite some time. We have a, a right wing uh, society. Uh, the horrific uh, events in October last year um, uh, helped uh, regiment the right wing, the extreme right wing in Israel, and. Uh, uh, failing to uh, uh, have an impact on the politics of Israel, people gather around um, the theme of uh, the uh, freeing the uh, hostages. And uh, I was there myself, together with my wife, to, uh, yesterday night in Tel Aviv. Special uh, transport was organized from Jerusalem, and uh, it was massive simply massive and uh, we were all uh, galvanized into one block of uh, demand to free the hostages. Yossi, I mean our protests a method that is going to have an effect because we've seen protests, maybe not as big as this one, but we've seen lots and lots of protests in Israel uh, since the beginning of last year, not only on this issue, uh, but also on uh, the controversial judicial reforms of Netanyahu. Correct, but I think we are in a, in a different situation right now. And this is a combination, almost amalgamation of different grievances that, that Israelis have towards this government. It's grievances that started, as you mentioned, against the assault on the democratic system in Israel and the independence of the judiciary. It's the fact that Israel and the government didn't defend its people on October 7. It's the way it conducts the war in, in, in Gaza uh, in a way that will compromise both its security and its credibility in the war. It's, it's about the hostages that are not coming home nearly a year now. And, 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 and it's about no end to this war and where soldiers are, are, are killed and people can't go back and live in the north and in, in, the, in the south. The fact that so many people that are not necessarily the natural supporters of the opposition, but people that probably voted for Netanyahu less than two years ago, are now in the streets and demonstrating is because they are fed up, they don't trust the prime minister and the right-wing government, they don't believe that they do everything in their capacity to release the, the hostages and they don't provide them uh, with security while the economy is suffering a lot. So all of this put together brings, I think it puts it in a unique situation in the country's history. Dan, uh, let me ask you about Netanyahu's response to this, because it seems in a swipe towards the protesters, he was quoted as saying, most Israelis are not swayed by Hamas propaganda. Yeah, I mean, Netanyahu himself is a master propagandist. I, I don't expect uh, Netanyahu to be very much impressive protests. And in general, it must be said that um, uh, protests very rarely cause, uh, you know, the, the, the collapse of governments and, and democratic societies. And Israel, uh, whatever else can be said, is, is one. And basically, Netanyahu can be expected to ignore the protests, uh, refer to them with disdain here and there, uh, and try to hang on until the next scheduled election, which is in late 2026, regardless of the size of these protests. And I agree, they, they were probably larger than the classic uh, center-left protests because Many people in, in, in Netanyahu's own camp who are generally aligned with the right wing are quite disgusted by the, uh, the, the just multifaceted failure of, of this government since the utter debacle of October 7th all the way to the current war, which uh, whatever achievements they may be able to point to in the degradation of Hamas uh, leaves Israel 11 months down the road in a situation where if Israel pulled out, Hamas would still be in power. So spin that as you will. Doesn't look like much of a success. Ilan, you were there, so let me ask you why people were protesting. Was it to get the ceasefire deal and to get the 100 or so Israelis held in Gaza to be released? Or are they also angry about the high levels of Palestinian civilian deaths, about 41,000 in almost a year? The reason I'm asking you is because I'm trying to work out, is there empathy at the moment among these people for the Palestinians? Are there forces here that could move things to dialogue? Uh, not at this point in time. 
Um, the, uh, the Israeli society is uh, by and large oblivious to what's going on in Gaza. Our media is not covering it. And uh, only people who watch uh, foreign channels uh, like your own um, have an idea what is, but this is a small minority and it doesn't play. Um, the Israelis uh, around me yesterday evening were simply focused on the release of hostages. And uh, it is very clear, the, the equation is very simple. If Netanyahu uh, decides to go along with uh, the Americans, the Qataris, the Egyptians, and get a deal, this means ceasefire, this means uh, Netanyahu in his own base, in the eyes of his own base, has lost the war because none of the three objectives, declared objectives of this war, were actually uh, uh, realized. Hamas is not dead, uh, the hostages are not back, and uh, Gaza, uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, we, we, are, we have no reason to believe that if things are left as as is that the Gaza Strip will stop uh, uh, being uh, a threat to the Israelis, Israelis living on our side of the border. So what, uh, what people expect is, regardless of what is going on in Gaza, regardless of the uh, political uh, ramifications for Netanyahu, and the war, bring back the hostages. If they persist, and if at the same time the international community persists, mainly the Americans, uh, then we, we might see a, a movement on the ground. Dan, let me ask you about the roles of the families um, of those who've died and those who have been held. How important are they in mobilising these mass protests, would you say? They're extremely important because they provide a human face and that's how our societies work. I mean, they, some of these families have become basically celebrities and they're very, very good at presenting their case and some are very telegenic uh, and, and are so passionate and determined and the tragedy that they've endured is something almost anyone uh, can, can connect with. So yeah, it, it is effective in, in creating these protests, but at the end of the day, um, what, what has just been said is also very, very true. If Israel uh, d does the deal that's on the table, Hamas has not changed its uh, basic perspective for, for many, many months, which is end the war, pull out of Gaza, leave us in power. Again, degraded, but still in power. Get back your hostages. That will look like a defeat for Israel. And in a way, it would be. But the, the, the fly in the ointment of that argument is that if Hamas is still in a position to stay, to, to remain in power, if Israel leaves, creating a vacuum, that's partly uh, because of Israel's own policy of avoiding any discussion or any planning for a day after scenario where there's an alternative to Hamas in Gaza. And, and an obvious uh, candidate would be a reframed, re rejiggered, rejuvenated Palestinian authority. But Netanyahu has not been able to, to, to go an inch in that direction because the extreme right that holds the government by the neck. Uh, has threatened to bring him down, and those threats are credible. So Israel is in quite a pickle where, it, it, no matter where it goes, uh, it, it, it's going to look like it failed in, in the conduct of the war. Now, they certainly, you know, punished Hamas. And by the way, the 41,000 figure includes uh, Hamas militants, so it's not all civilians, but a lot of civilians have been killed as well. And there is in Israel uh, some introspection about that, but also I have to add a, a considerable degree of disbelief uh, and the numbers coming out of Gaza, and also something of a disappointment in the world uh, community that seems to not understand what Israelis believe is true, which is that uh, civilians are dying because Hamas uses them as human shields, hides beneath them, and wants them to be killed, because that is good PR for them versus Israel. Okay, Yossi, um, all of these people want a ceasefire. Netanyahu is not accepting a ceasefire. Now, his stated reason is the control of the Philadelphia Corridor. That's the 14-kilometer buffer zone that's uh, inside Gaza on the border uh, with Egypt. Now, these negotiations have been going on for a very long time. That didn't seem to be a problem some months ago for Netanyahu. It was not a, not a problem when President Biden announced that Israel had proposed a deal back in May. It wasn't a problem even when this deal, um, the proposed deal, was endorsed by the UN Security Council. What do you make 
of the Prime Minister's stated reason uh, for opposing uh, this ceasefire? This is exactly what most people don't think that this is a real reason for Netanyahu not to accept a deal. We're not so sure where Hamas stands on, on, on a deal, but it's at least the Israeli people want to see that Netanyahu is doing his best. And when every time there are new conditions in the Philadelphia corridor, all of a sudden came as the, 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 the the reason or the excuse, as many say that, of not uh, selling a deal, then we are allowed to be suspicious that there are ulterior motives, and their ulterior motive is for Netanyahu to stay in power as long as possible. It's, it's, it's closely connected and related to his, his corruption trial that is ongoing already for and deliberated in, in an Israeli court for four years. He delays even giving evidence but don't take my word for it, take the word of the defense minister, uh, Yoav Galland, who is not exactly a, a dove, that says hostages first and then we'll deal with the security of Philadelphia, or take the Philadelphia uh, corridor, or take the word of the chief of staff and the former chief of staff, Benny Gantz and, and Gadi Eisenkot, that are not again exactly lefty. They're saying that, this, that you can deal with it later, but for Israel, the most important issue, as the protesters yesterday in Tel Aviv and in other places uh, kept saying, hostages first, because this is part of the ethos of the Israeli society. This is part of the ethos of, of the IDF. It's also a Jewish ethos of making sure that hostages are uh, coming back and returning, and they're doing everything in their capacity to, 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 to return them. And if this is not the case, Everyone is suspicious that, yes, Netanyahu has an ulterior motive. OK. Um, Ilan, you heard Yossi there say there may be political motives. I'd like to come back to that in a moment. But first, just examine one other point that I've, I've heard some people saying, because Netanyahu is talking about the Philadelphia corridor that's uh, the buffer zone near Egypt. He also wants to keep the Netzarim corridor, which is one bisecting the Gaza Strip. I've heard some suggesting there might be a hidden grand plan that he wants to keep the Gaza Strip divided, perhaps a little bit like the West Bank with fortification corazones, uh, uh, corridors and buffer zones, um, you know, a sort of Swiss cheese like the West Bank rather than the one contiguous Palestinian area. Do you think there's anything in that? Well, I believe that um, Netanyahu and his uh, extreme right-wing government, uh, they do not look uh, at, um, at what is going on in Gaza just in the Gaza context. And um, uh, some people on the very right wing uh, discuss resettlement or uh, uh, taking the disengagement of 2005 back into, uh, in, into history. So you, and, mean, uh, you mean some people are saying they would kick Palestinians out of Gaza or bring back Israeli settlements inside Gaza? Uh, at least bring back Israeli settlements. But I think uh, there is uh, something to, to look at uh, beyond the context of Gaza, and that is the West Bank. The, um, the extreme right wing in Israel is uh, looking at um, options to consolidate Israeli hold of the West Bank in its entirety and um, uh, annex it to Israel. And for that, it needs to uh, uh, take control of the Jordan Valley, uh, unilateral control of the Jordan Valley. And in a way, uh, of course, uh, the international community refuses uh, this desire and in a way, the uh, Philadelphia uh, corridor is a uh, mini uh, Jordan Valley, if you want. Um, if uh, Israel succeeds in uh, in uh, convincing the Americans and others that it needs a corridor in order to protect Israel for the defense of Israel, this will be a big step forward in the contestation around the uh, occupied territories at large. And I okay. think we need to take a look at that. Let me bring in Dan. Um, just tell us, Dan, your view. What would happen if Netanyahu signed 
the ceasefire deal as it stands now? What would happen to his coalition? Would it collapse, number one? And number two, remind us about the state of those legal cases against Netanyahu. What would happen to Netanyahu if he was no longer the prime minister? Well, the, the the cynical view, which is not entirely unreasonable, is that, as, as has been said here, he's at least one factor in his thinking is that if, if the war goes on, then the circumstances don't arise that bring down his government. If he signed a deal and Israel pulled out of Gaza and Hamas had victory celebrations in Gaza City, then even if Israel got back the hostages, and it's true that Israeli society wants to prioritize the hostages because they're dying in prison. In, in, in the tunnels. But if that happened, uh, it's, it's, it seems to me not implausible that, that the government really would collapse because there would be tremendous anger on the part of the Israeli far right and some political calculations by the leaders of the far right that they could do very well in the election. Um, and, and, and moving right along, if a new election were held, polls show that Netanyahu would lose and lose rather badly. Uh, because of the shift that happened as a result of both the very unpopular ju judicial reforms, so-called judicial reforms, and the breakdown of October 7th and everything since. Now, would that affect his legal cases? It, it, I've heard it, uh, Earlier on the show, it seemed to be suggested that the cases are somehow no longer going on and they might be resumed if he ceased, ceased being prime minister. That's not true. The cases are going on. But, but his state of being prime minister, and moreover, prime minister in the middle of the of, of a tremendously intensive war does enable him to uh, to uh, implement various uh, shenanigans and delay factors, and that's what he's been doing. He uh, he has asked the courts to delay his own um, uh, 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 witness testimony, and they've agreed. And I think that's now set for uh, for later in the fall or early in the winter. And you can expect more of that if he's a private citizen. Uh, it's quite likely that the cases would speed up. But you know, the man is seventy four. Uh, a justice of this kind in Israel is the wheels are slow. Uh, even if he's convicted, there will be, uh, 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 you know, appeals. So I don't think the, the case is necessarily the main thing here. What we have uh, is, is a prime minister who, despite the vehemence of the opposition to him, which I assess at this point is a majority position in, in the Israeli public, does nonetheless have a quite rabid base of support. And also suffers, I believe, from uh, the most classic case I've seen in covering about 100 countries in the world, the Louis XIV complex, where he really does believe that he's critical to, to the prosecution of events. Now, how one can believe that, given the spectacular failures of the past year and a half or two, uh, is, is really something for uh, psychologists, not myself. OK. Yossi, uh, you heard there what Dan said. He thinks that uh, Netanyahu would lose if there was election right now. Just take the temperature of public opinion on the ceasefire. How many people support a ceasefire, would you say? And also this issue of the Philadelphia Corridor. Where do, where do Israeli people stand on that? I think, first of all, we need to recognize that Netanyahu became a burden on Israeli society and he's a sort of a bottleneck that stops everything from changing. He, when he goes, and he will go, uh, it won't solve everything, but it will be a start of being able to build different discourse within the Israeli society. I think for the Israelis right now, is mainly about releasing the hostages, ceasefire, and then probably replacing the Netanyahu government. As you asked earlier about empathy, unfortunately, there is no much empathy uh, for the uh, for Palestinians. There is no trust that there is a possibility to move forward toward a two-state solution. But we are in the midst of a, one of the most violent episodes between the Israel and Palestinians. And that's exactly where Israel, as the Palestinians themselves, need new government, new leadership, New, new discourse, new understanding that the only way to move forward is by looking into a two-state solution, in, a, in accepting that everyone should have the uh, similar, uh, similar, similar uh, human rights, political rights, civil rights. So as far as Israel is concerned, they want Gaza not to pose a threat anymore, whether it's through uh, holding to the Philadelphia corridor or not. If most of them 
are not are not are not that concerned about that. But there were okay. guarantees that El 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 Elan, if I can bring again. you bring you in at the end, you are a former Israeli uh, soldier, a former Israeli diplomat who resigned because you believe in a two-state uh, solution. Where's the Israeli public on that? Because I look back in, in the 1990s after the Oslo Accords, about 70% of Israelis supported a two-state solution. Where do the figures stand now? Are you rather depressed by the situation? Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, it is quite depressive to be a, a member of a small minority who are uh, deeply convinced that Israel is has taken the wrong path tragically and uh, it is uh, competing with uh, a history that will uh, lead us to a dead end. Uh, we will eventually, we will have to have uh, the Palestinians get the uh, right for self-determination manifested in sovereignty over their own land and uh, getting rid of the Israeli domination. All of this will take place. We don't know when and we don't know what the circumstances will prevail, in what way the circumstances necessary for that will prevail. But um, we are uh, determined to uh, uh, play whatever humble role in it uh, to see uh, the transformation uh, taking place and we will be back uh, to, to, to the game. OK. Uh, Dan, finally, uh, you are a former journalist, so I'm going to ask you to make a prediction, as journalists often have to do. What could change things? What is Netanyahu's biggest vulnerability? Uh, briefly, please. His biggest vulnerability is if the Americans lose patience and uh, cease sending munitions and cease their uh, veto at the UN Security Council, that would be a game changer. I doubt it's going to happen, certainly not before the US election, quite possibly not even after, but, but you never know. The other vulnerability is, you know, life kind of goes on and there are rules in Israel. And if he fails to pass a budget, uh, then the government will collapse and there will be elections by March, I believe, of 2025. And that actually could happen because of things that have nothing to do with the war and have everything to do with Israel's other myriad problems, in particular, what to do about the ultra-Orthodox community that refuses to serve in the military uh, and uh, and presents many, many other challenges. This budget thing actually could be the deus ex machina that fixes the problem. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on Inside Story Israel. Our guests were Dan Perry, Ilan Baruch and Yossi Mechelberg. Al Jazeera's coverage of the war on Gaza and the situation across the region continues here around the clock. You can catch the latest on your phone with our app or by going to aljazeera.com. We want to hear from you too. Post your comments on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or you can use X, where we are at AJ Inside Story. From me, James Bays, and the team here in Doha, bye-bye for now.